Okay, good morning. Happy Monday. I'm going to show you the lesson plans and the topics, the assignments for this week, which is week 11. And then the bulk of our class today will be a close examination and analysis of chapters 12 through 13. I will provide a short introduction and then I will review with you a selection of passages that I posted on a separate page. The link to this page is listed under today's lesson plan. As you can see, A is today's plan, the analysis of those chapters, and this is the page that I created with sections highlighting the most important ideas in those chapters. On Wednesday, we will complete our examination of the pages and the examples of Machiavellian behavior from Benigna Machiavelli. I will also talk about the final exam. I will provide some of the details. I will review uh, the nature of the questions, the areas you should focus on, how many questions will there be, and in general, on what area of our program for this semester. On Friday, we'll have a TV series instead of a film, and I, I changed my plans slightly, I thought, since we're talking about the plan was to include scenes from House of Cards. Why not start with the British version of House of Cards and then examine the American version? The British version is much shorter. Maybe you're not familiar with it, but it's a good rendition of the Machiavellian themes in the trilogy of books on which the series was based. Uh, if you have Amazon Prime, I believe the uh, the series, the BBC series, is free for for everyone with the Amazon Prime membership. But I, I haven't verified that. Um, the assignments, of course, a continuation of reading from the prints and we're approaching the conclusion there are 26 chapters and on house of cards similarly to what we found for the tom ripley series there are plenty of articles and essays but there is one book in particular which is ideal both for our understanding of the american version of House of Cards, and also because when you read those chapters, you find fine examples of the kind of discussion and analysis that you should be doing uh, for your final paper. So even though you might be working on a report, but look at the kind of comparisons that are established in here and how you conduct an analysis of Machiavellian themes with specific references to Machiavelli, even when the text that you have in front of you or the film or the TV series may not include direct references to Machiavelli. That is to say, the target, the goal is not to find two lines or a passage or a paragraph in Machiavelli that was used to script a scene, which is rare. It occurs in the case of a Bronx tale, for example, that's not usually the case. Usually. You have to uh, connect the themes, the ideologies of the text you're analyzing and compare them with chapters or ideas where those ideologies found a fertile ground where there is uh, reason to believe that those chapters were inspiring, but then you have to measure how close the modern reinterpretation may be to the original. And I've included three in the excerpts, three short chapters 
American Machiavelli, Machiavelli would not be impressed. And is Frank, Frank Underwood, the man for the job, house of cards, and the problem of dirty hands. As usual, these excerpts are placed on a Google Drive and uh, Stony Brook login is required in order to access the excerpts. Let me know if you encounter any issues. <clears throat> and this is the page that I created and that is linked under week 11 with passages, summaries, and ideas from chapters 12 through 14. The image that I picked for, for to illustrate, to open this page, is a famous fresco that you can find in the Duomo in Florence. It is the portrait of Giovanni Acuto by uh, 15th century painter Paolo Uccello. It was made around 1436. Giovanni Acuto is the Italian uh, rendition of the name of a British uh, leader of mercenary soldiers whose name, whose British name was John Ockwood. Ockwood. Um, and uh, this is a very famous portrait because it, 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 is, it gives you a good idea of the evolution of art, of the arts during the 1400s. Uh, the, the attempt to make this a, a, a three-dimensional uh, rendition of a monument. In fact, initially the idea was that a sculpture should be placed on the side of the church and then later on uh, this fresco was made and it was made uh, 40 to 50 years after uh, the death of this uh, foreign leader whose work was very much esteemed and appreciated in Florence, uh, John Awkward, Giovanni Acuto. And it's interesting that, that Acuto, which sounds almost like awkward, has its own meaning. It's an adjective in Italian that means sharp, smart, right, intuitive. That's what acuto means in reference to someone. If you say someone is acuto or a statement is acuto, that's the idea. But this man fought in England for the King of England. He fought in France as a mercenary, mercenary leader. And then he came to Italy during the second half of his life. And he fought for a variety of states, but principally for Milan, where in fact he married his second wife who was related to the aristocratic family that controlled the government of Milan and for Florence. In the case of Florence, he fought some famous battles that he was able to win thanks to his brilliant tactical mind and into his 60s, he was leading mercenary troops for Florence. And as I said, in Florence, he uh, died and was honored. His funeral was a, a pretty big thing where, where the city uh, showed his gratitude uh, to this man. Machiavelli, we'll see, is not in favor of the use of mercenary forces. And in reference even to mercenary leaders who were cherished and celebrated, his idea is that their career cannot be too long or otherwise they'll turn against the cities that hire them. And if Giovanni Acuto, John Hawkwood is celebrated, it's simply that he died before he could try to take control of Florence thanks to the influence he had gained and the forces, the mercenary forces that he controlled and that were loyal to him more than to the government of Florence. And it's easy for you to Google the name of the 
historical figure or the name of the painter and find more information about this work of art if you're interested. So let me go through the general introduction. We are halfway through The Prince, which has 26 chapters and the first 11 or 12 have more pages than the others and the rest of the book. And Machiavelli feels that he has completed the introduction of the core ideas about politics and leadership. And he warns the reader in several passages from these chapters 12 through 13 that it is so. That at this point, all he has to do is to add details that are secondary in terms of relevance to what he just explained. And he focuses on the military, he focuses on warfare as an art, as an area where leaders can become more skilled through training. So training plays a big role. It is not just the talents that nature endowed them with. Therefore, given the premise, you would expect that force be the focus of these chapters. And for the sake of appearances, that is uh, accurate as a statement. When you look just at the surface of these chapters, it seems that the emphasis is always on force. However, influence is still there and our analysis will focus on trying to understand how influence plays a role in this. So even though force is mentioned through references to soldiers and wars, more often than not, influence is still there, sometimes implied in the reasoning put on the page by Machiavelli, sometimes explicitly referred to. It is through a combination of force and influence that you get to the establishment of deterrence, right? which Machiavelli sometimes refers to as simply as reputation. Reputation is one of the key words in these chapters, but it's really talking about deterrence. And deterrence is key to establishing the security of a state. So you have to be able to sustain an attack you have to be able to attack preemptively to defeat your external enemies. At the same time, you cannot be deploying your military forces all the time because that approach would be too expensive in terms of resources and would eventually ruin the economy of the state or hamper the growth, the economic growth of a state and without economic uh, well-being, without productivity, without economic growth, then the military cannot be sustained. And in general, the political policies of a leader cannot be supported. Therefore, you need to rely also on deterrence, which means there will be instances where your enemies will not even plan an attack because you have such a reputation, you're thought to be, you're believed to be so strong militarily and so skilled at the art of warfare that they'll be afraid that any kind of war uh, might uh, uh, not be successful, okay? That there is no uh, uh, control over the outcome of a war because of your reputation. It is through a combination of force and influence that authority is established within a society, within a state. And you find some references to it. And that, of course, the authority is the premise. The military and deterrence were necessary to establish the security at the borders of a state, inside a state, inside a society. You need stability, of course, stability for Machiavelli means order. And again, order is seen as instrumental to economic growth. So even though 
There is a lot of talking about politics and about warfare. Don't forget that ultimately Machiavelli already has a mindset whereby politics is dominated by economic concerns and concerns about productivity and economic growth because only that way you can have material resources available for the use of power. Throughout these chapters, you find a great insistence on the idea of control, again, which is not surprising. And the style is shaped by logic, whereby Machiavelli tries to go through all the possible cases, all the possible scenarios, also all the possible arguments and counter-arguments to provide a systematic and comprehensive treatment of what being in control entails, okay? And why this insistence of logic? Because after all, as we said many times, Machiavelli has completely removed, or almost completely removed from the book, ethical, moral considerations, value-driven models or practices of leadership. And instead, he has replaced the traditional approach with a pragmatic consideration of leadership and its practices. In this pragmatic consideration, you have to go through all the possible cases because everything that is possible could be an option that you'll have, could be a scenario that you'll have to face. So you cannot limit the scenarios based on what an ideal leader would do or should do, you have to be ready for every possible decisions. And therefore, logic becomes the supporting structure of the reasoning because it has to replace another kind of analysis, another kind of approach driven by moral value, by traditional values of what is good for the leader, good for society, etc. Of course, the good and the well-being of society is also present in one way or the other, meaning that exactly because stability and security lead to order and productivity, we can add that, or growth, ultimately the citizens should benefit from this. Okay? Because the idea is that a citizen that is productive because they are confident about their leader, they are confident in the stability and security of their community, is also a happy citizen. A citizen whose material well-being is increasing, is a positive element of society. And as I said, this is the underlying principle that you find at work in the prince, uh, placed there by someone who grew up in a city-state such as Florence that was economically one of the most powerful cities in Europe. Not just in Italy, but in Europe. And as, as I've said many times, the reason why you go to Florence and Florence together with Rome and Venice are uh, the, the, the fixed points <clears throat> of, of a tour, of almost every tour of Italy. The reason why you find so much art in Florence is exactly because there was an enormous amount of wealth, part of which was applied to the building of churches and palaces and the commission of works of art, right? Paintings, frescoes, sculptures, etc. Okay, that is the introduction. And let's go to chapter 12 and start examining what Machiavelli has to say. As I, as I said, I've included only a select number of passages together with some considerations. So whenever you find quotation marks, those are quotes. Whenever you don't find those are my statements. It's always difficult <clears throat> on, on Monday. <clears throat>
for my voice. <clears throat> in, the, in the premise to this chapter, you find what I mentioned before, Machiavelli saying, I've said all the important things, but in order for my reasoning to be complete, I'll add a few more things. But the understanding is that these uh, considerations about the military <clears throat> are secondary to the system that Machiavelli has introduced in the previous chapters. That is to say, Machiavelli himself is aware that the trap for the reader would be to overestimate how important the military by itself, how important force by itself is to the exercise of power, when in fact uh, the, the system is more complex and is based on a combination of force and influence. That's why Machiavelli is saying that nothing in this short book is irrelevant. Everything has deeper implications. The focus, according to Machiavelli, is offensive and defensive measures appropriate to each of the aforementioned principalities, meaning new principalities, old principalities, mixed, meaning a combination of new and old government. So we're talking about security at the borders. However, Machiavelli will constantly be referring also to the other side, what happens inside a state inside society, okay? So keep that in mind. Machiavelli will be talking about the different kinds of military forces. In particular, he will insist on the use and abuse of mercenary soldiers, and clearly Machiavelli's position uh, couldn't be uh, clearer to understand. Machiavelli is opposed to the mercenary soldiers. Machiavelli believes that the current crisis that Italy is going through during Machiavelli's adult life. And while Machiavelli is writing The Prince in the 1510s, has a lot to do with the choice by states such as Florence or Venice to rely on mercenary soldiers or auxiliary forces, meaning forces that were given out on loan uh, by foreign governments, that is to say, forces that you cannot control completely because they are comprised of individuals who are outside of society. And if they're outside of the system, how can you really control them simply because you are giving them a salary, a stipend, okay? This has to do, a lot of this has to do with Machiavelli's own background and Machiavelli's own experience and the experience of his community in Florence, the stories of the previous 120, 150 years in Florence, a history of instability, a history of constant uh, wars. And Machiavelli himself, during his tenure with the Republic of Florence before he was fired by the Medicis when they came back in 1512, involved also the training of rural forces, of rural soldiers going out to the towns in Tuscany, the small towns in Tuscany, to recruit the peasants, the best of the peasants, to train them in the use of modern weapons and to train them in uh, military movements, Etc. Something that he was not completely successful with, mind you. But uh, evidently, the implication for these chapters, if you keep in mind that the whole book was also written so that the Medicis could see what a powerful mind they were missing on and uh, get the desire in their hearts to rehire. Uh, Machiavelli, if you keep that in mind, that motivation for the book, it means that Machiavelli wants to have a second go at trying to organize an army of citizens and trying to uh, show that his understanding of what an army of citizens should be 
has increased, has evolved, and therefore uh, he is in a better position. He could restart with a better premise on the work that he left unfinished during the Republic. Always keep that in mind. Machiavelli offers a recap of what he has been saying so far, what he has been writing so far, and tries to provide a context for his analysis of the use of the military. It is necessary for a prince to, to have good foundations, which is another way for Machiavelli to say, you need to have a system in place to ensure complete control, right? Foundations means the idea, the metaphor of the foundation, and Machiavelli in chapter seven will talk about architecture in, in a clear way, but in general, the idea of foundation is that you have to have something you can always rely on. And keep in mind that although you need both force and influence, of these two, the most reliable component has to be, in Machiavelli's mind, force. And again, going back to his own time, his own experience, and the experience of the generations before him, his father, his great fa grandfather, his great grandfather, and all the stories that circulated still in Florence from those previous generations led him to believe that force was the only thing you can safely rely on because there was a lot of instability in Florence from the late 1300s through Machiavelli's time. Lots of uh, internal fights and struggles in the city of Florence between different factions, different classes, different members of the same class. That's why, in general, Machiavelli, through this chapter, shows very little confidence in the citizens, in humanity in general, and insists so much on force because he thinks that only that kind of control ensured by force uh, can be predicted. Although he himself has to bring, go back to uh, the discussion of influence a number of times because ultimately only relying on the use of force is a losing game within this kind of system because it would affect productivity, right? And what we said many times, the history of the Cold War, the losses suffered, and, and the ultimate defeat uh, by the Soviet Union would be the best modern example of that. Relying too much on force, relying so much on force that you can indeed have almost complete control, but productivity ultimately is harmed and you lose the war. The principal foundations that all states must have, whether new or old or mixed, are good laws and good arts. Now, by good laws, Machiavelli refers to everything that ensures the authority of the government. So it's not just the laws themselves. Criminal laws, the penal code, is referring to the organizations of society in general, okay? So, Keep that in mind. That is to say, the system that you put in place whereby citizens will behave like good, honest citizens because they want to play a collaborative game with the government, because they're in sync with the government, especially if they manage to be productive. And the citizens Machiavelli has in mind are mostly the merchants. The entire population, but particularly the merchants as the driving force of an economy a commercial economy such as uh, Florence. And within the system, though, you still need to be able to deploy force, such as arrest a citizen, jail a citizen, or even uh, have a pu the public executions of citizens who have deviated, have violated the rules, because some of the citizens will not abide by the laws by themselves. For some of the citizens' influence will not be enough. However, the combination of authority and force, of influence and force, will, in general, keep in mind, habituate 
the citizens to honest practices, to be fair uh, to one another, okay? Because those citizens know they're not above the rules. They're not in a situation where they can get by, or get away with by major violations of those rules. So, good laws and good arms, but in the next paragraph, Machiavelli tells you good arms are more reliable, and therefore they're more important than good laws. Keep in mind what I told you about his own experience, his own bias, right? And in the end, it is still the combination of force and influence that works even in establishing the authority of the government, the organization of society, okay? I say, therefore, that the arms with which a prince defends his state are either his own, meaning citizens from the state that are being trained to fight, or they're mercenary, meaning someone who's coming from outside. And keep in mind that throughout Europe, including especially certain areas of Italy, Central Italy, for example, and areas of Central Europe, especially Switzerland and Southern Germany, and some areas of Eastern Europe, all across the continent, there were small regions where the economy, the local economy, was not strong enough and really was mostly based on agriculture, but the agriculture was sufficient only to sustain local needs and there were no exports, commercial or agricultural. And therefore, in those communities, young men and adults up to a certain age would spend a few months a year fighting as mercenaries in, our, in other areas so that they could bring back or send back money to their local community, which is why you go to the Vatican and you find the Swiss guards. Why the Swiss guards? Simply because those were the mercenaries the papacy relied on during the 40, late 1400s and especially the 1500s that ensure the survival and the protection of the papacy and a tradition was established. But as I said, uh, there were similar communities or areas in Lazio, in Umbria, in central Italy, in southern Germany, where a lot of the young and adult population fought several months a year, usually between April and September or October. In some instances, their uh, um, stint could prolong, could be prolonged and last a year, two years, but eventually the idea was that they would come back with money. And therefore those local economies would benefit from this influx of external money brought in by their uh, mercenaries, by their citizens fighting abroad. So we have an army of citizens, an army of mercenary, and then we have the auxiliary forces, again, uh, I, I don't think the textbook included a note to explain this, but it needs to be explained. Auxiliary, in Machiavelli's definition, are those soldiers that someone will give another state to use. For example, the King of France loaning some military units to an Italian state for a period of time. Okay, so those are again, foreign fighters, the only difference being that either you're not paying them, you're not paying for their salaries, someone else is, but there is a price to pay nonetheless, because if the King of France or someone else is giving you troops, they want something in exchange, right? An alliance, there is either a political price or a monetary price attached to that. Mixed would be a combination of mercenary and auxiliary, or a combination of auxiliary and your own army, okay? Right away you find a blunt statement by Machiavelli, mercenary and auxiliary arts are useless and dangerous, and it goes back to the idea that 
if you ask yourself, what kind of control do I have over these forces? The mercenary, I'm paying their salary. But they can just go home, right? If I stop paying for their salaries, I, they still have money, right? Because I've been paying them for some time and they just go home until they find someone else that will need them, right? Because they would be in contact with different states, with different governments. The, major, the mercenaries would have leaders. Those leaders would be in contact with various governments and negotiating a contract, right? So you stop paying for the mercenaries. First of all, they're there. So they can loot. They can uh, offend in Machiavellian terms, the local community. They can make damage. And if you stop paying for them, if you manage to send them out, they just go home and wait for the next contract and they go fight for someone else. So very little control you have over them. Same for the auxiliary forces. The auxiliary forces ultimately are loyal to whomever send them there. And, and therefore you have little control in terms of force because you, you rely on them. So it's not like you have another army to defeat the mercenaries if, it's, if they start a rebellion and you have very little influence over them because they are members of an external community. If a prince keeps his state founded on mercenary arms, he will never stand firm of or secure, which is another way to say that he has no control over those forces. And then Machiavelli goes through the psychological mindset of the mercenaries, showing that they cannot be a really good professional. And notice how he includes, they have no fear of God, no faith with men, which seems paradoxical. We know that Machiavelli is not religious, possibly an atheist, yet this is another way to reaffirm the influence the relevance on, of the concept of influence, meaning that in order to control the citizens and also in order to control your soldiers, you need to have some boundaries in place. Some of the boundaries are based on force. If you don't obey, there will be consequences. Jail or physical punishment, or uh, ultimately you can be executed. But you cannot be applying force all the time. You need to have influence, and influence means that they have to have some other fear. Not just fear of you, but fear of God, fear of going to hell if they don't be, if they behave honestly, okay? And in peace, you're despoiled by them, meaning you're wasting your resources. In war, you're despoiled by your enemies, meaning you uh, uh, stand the chance of losing a war, and then your enemies will take those resources uh, from you. And it, he continues by saying, you cannot believe that just giving them money, uh, a small stipend, will make them loyal to you. And love in here, other reason in here, is another reference to uh, influence, meaning they have no particular connection with the leader, no particular confidence in the leader's effectiveness in producing something that will be beneficial to them. So how can you expect them to want to die for you in war? And he's saying that this was the number one problem for, year, for Italy and he mentions a very famous statement, which is not entirely accurate historically, that Charles the, the Eighth, King of France, who invaded Italy in 1494 and advanced through northern and central Italy to attack southern Italy. Southern Italy was his target. But in order to have safe passage and in order to protect his supply lines, he had to attack militarily the areas he was going through from France to Naples. He couldn't go to Naples with ships because he didn't have a fleet that was big enough to transport soldiers or supplies uh, directly from France to Italy. He had to go through the peninsula. And the famous statement is that he 
uh, was able to seize Italy with a piece of chalk, meaning that he could just get to a place such as Milan or Florence and with chalk mark the buildings that would be seized by his soldiers and used as barracks uh, by uh, his soldiers, okay? So he didn't need to fight. In fact, he had to fight and uh, there were sieges, uh, there were battles. He won all of them and ultimately he won enough of them by the time he reached Tuscany that everyone was scared and they uh, let him pass through. And in the final passage here, Machiavelli says, someone said that uh, we lost that war with Charles VIII because of our sins. And this is a reference to Savonarola, as the footnote in the textbook tells you, the uh, friar, the Dominican friar, whose homilies, whose uh, religious ideology inspired a political party in Florence that uh, controlled the government in the 1490s uh, when Machiavelli was a young man and right to the period when he started working for the local administration. Of course, Savonarola, as a religious prophet, was referring to moral sins, and he was famous for starting these fires where people were invited to burn the bad books, the cards, because playing cards, especially for money, is bad for your soul and the dice. Because playing dice, of course, is another way to, to waste time and, and ruin your, your uh, chances for, for salvation. And Machiavelli says, well, we're not talking about those sins. The sins were incapacity, inaptitude, the inability to understand that with mercenary soldiers, you can stop a national army such as that of the King of France. And so it's an ironic stab at Savonarola. Notice in terms of logic, how Machiavelli, he's done that from the very first chapter, is proceeding by laying out all the possible scenarios. So mercenary captains are either men excellent in arms or not. And then he goes through the two branches, but each branch can also have other scenarios, right? So that's why I talked about logic and examination of all cases. If they're excellent, you cannot trust them because they have too much leadership, right? And they have power and control themselves. So they, they become competitors for the power. Keep in mind Machiavelli's idea that within any context or ecosystem, there is only finite amount of power in terms of control. And therefore, if you have someone in that ecosystem who has good leadership, his power will increase at your expense. If their power increases, then yours, uh, your, your ability to control uh, goes down, okay? And he explained why and the various scenarios. If they're not, of course, if they're not good, then you'll suffer damages anyway, because if they're not good, you will lose battles, right? And you will not be able to ensure security at your borders. And then you see the same way that you have these logical branching of the reasoning, you also have arguments and counter arguments, whereby Machiavelli is imagining an objection. If it were objected, so if anyone objected to my reasoning that anyone who has arms in his hands, force, will do this, meaning if you have force, then you are a leader, you acquire control, whether he is a mercenary or not, I would reply that. And it goes through a logical kind of argumentation. The arms have to be directed either by a prince or by a republic. Again, branching in two different directions and then going through those uh, arms of the reasoning. The prince should go in person and himself assume the office of the captain. As I said before, you cannot have someone else lead the military if the military are vital to the exercise of control over the government. The prince himself has to be an expert in warfare. Has, and if he's not, he has to train for that. Otherwise, 
to delegate control, to delegate the command of the military, means that you are giving out too much control to someone who could replace you. Clear enough, easy enough to understand. In the case of the Republic, and keep in mind that Machiavelli is essentially a Republican, even though he's writing this book, and again, he's writing this book because he's the, the, the primary target audience for this book is the Medicis, not the Republic. He wants to be employed by them. The Republic has to send its own citizens, and also, as we said, Machiavelli believes that a prince or a leader with absolute powers is required to resolve the crisis of Italy that the Republican way, the Republican solution to that crisis would take a few generations, whereas Italy only has a few years before the crisis became, becomes fatal to their independence. So the Republic has to send its own citizens. You need to have a Republican army made up of citizens. If it sends one a leader, a military leader for that army, who does not prove to be a courageous man, you just replace him. If the leader is courageous, then he will be subject to laws, right? So once again, you go back to this side and you have authority, meaning in a republic, no one is above the, the rules. In a princedom, the prince is like a dictator. He can make or break the rules as much as he wants. There is no one above him, no authority above him, and therefore he can change the rules to fit his needs. In a republic, there is a government above the leader of the army who can enforce their authority either through influence or, in the case of force, to have that leader of the republican army jailed, right, for uh, rebellion, for treason, etc. Okay? And uh, so Machiavelli clearly in the next passage shows that he favors the situation in which a prince alone is in charge because he thinks that that is the most dynamic way of leading a state in a, in a situation of war. The most agile format for a critical situation. The bigger the crisis, the more agile the leadership, the model of leadership needs to be. And that's why ultimately even a Republican such as Machiavelli favors this kind of leadership with uh, endless amounts of powers. Um, and, and then he says, though, even a Republic that would be subject to the attack of one of their citizens who manages to acquire control of the army can resist that kind of attack and makes examples, Roman Sparta and antiquity. The Swiss, in here, when he's talking about the Swiss, he's not talking about the Swiss mercenaries this time. He's talking about the city-states of Switzerland who were nominally, formally under the authority of the empire, of the German empire, but enjoyed a great degree of independence and he, has, he, he explains that uh, autonomy on the fact that they're trained and they're armed. Then he mentions the Carthaginians who were the arch enemies of ancient Rome. And he said the Carthaginians relied on the mercenaries and then they had to fight uh, a mercenary war. That is to say those mercenaries after the first war with Rome rebelled against Carthage. And later in another passage, he shows that even the Romans became weaker when at the end of the empire they had to rely on Germanic and uh, other barbarian soldiers that they paid as mercenaries. Then Machiavelli goes through possible exceptions to this. And he says, well, again, the implication is someone might argue that Venetians and Florentines were successful in the past through the use of mercenary leaders. But Machiavelli explains that that was due to the particular circumstances and in general you cannot rely on mercenary forces or mercenary leaders. The Florentines were favored by chance. So fortune, but you cannot rely on fortune for, for long because 
of the virtuous captains who they might have feared, who might have acquired control of Florence, some did not win, some had opposition, some turned their ambition elsewhere, meaning they moved to other states. And then he explains the same for the Venetians. What kind of circumstances allow the Venetians to be successful for a time with mercenary forces, which seems to contradict the uh, laws put forward by Machiavelli, but again, is just that they were fortunate. The circumstances were in their favor, but Machiavelli doesn't want to have anyone rely on fortune because fortune means you have no control. It's something you cannot control, okay? So, at the end of this chapter, he talks about changes in uh, warfare that happened during that time, uh, thanks to the introduction of mercenary forces in Italy from Switzerland and other places, that there was a reduced use of the infantry, an increased use of the cavalry, and he explains that not in terms of military tactics, but in terms of marketing, in terms of the economy of the use of mercenary forces. He says that uh, the ratio has changed so much that in modern armies, you can find out of 20,000 soldiers that less than 2,000, less than 2,000 are infantry, the rest, 90% of an army can be uh, cavalry. And he says, well, this is obvious because of course, mercenaries are not huge groups. And again, normally you would have uh, the men from, a sa from the same area form a brigade under either a local leader or a leader they hired, they contracted themselves. But normally a, a mercenary unit would be from 500 men to four or 5,000 men. And then they would get together sometimes under the same leader. So a, an infantry war is a war of numbers and a, they couldn't play that game of numbers. And also relying on the cavalry allows for the mercenaries to be more mobile and they want to be mobile because they need to move around uh, whenever, wherever they are requested. Okay, their intervention is requested. Also the cavalry requires more training, more skills. So if you go like Machiavelli would do to the peasants around San Gimignano and train them, it's easier to train them in the use of a rifle or a handgun than it is to train them to fight from a horse. Okay. So you have professionals who, based on this kind of marketing, offer a skill that cannot be found locally. And because you have a horse and horses are expensive to maintain and you have weapons, uh, such as armor, etc., then you can ask for uh, more money. What is, however, what are the conditions for these professionals? Because they are long-term professionals, right? So they don't want to die. They try not to kill one another in battles, okay? So when someone uh, uh, concedes that they're being defeated, they just surrender. They don't fight to the last man. They take prisoners without asking ransom. That was a medieval practice, common medieval practice. So you, you take someone prisoner and then the family has to pay money for you to return that prisoner. They don't do that because they don't want to suffer the uh, economic consequences of being taken prisoner. They don't want to fight at night, right? Because they're professionals uh, and it's easier to kill someone at night right, and they don't want to kill each other. They don't want to campaign during the winter, not only because the conditions are harsh, but also because normally these mercenaries go back home during the winter, where they can plant the, the seeds for the new crops, where they can spend time with their families, right? And then they come back in March or April when spring is coming. In fact, even in the language of uh, countries such as Italy, you find proverbs and saying hinting to the fact that by April 25th or so, that's the time of war. That's when you can expect a war and be fearful. Nigel. Well, this is good. Uh, 
basically a Swiss um, agreement or is it for uh, Italian mercenaries too? That mercenaries in general. Yeah. He mentions the Swiss more commonly because those were the uh, mercenaries more in demand during his time and later by the 1520s southern germans became very much in demand in this kind of market but even within italy you find uh, plenty of uh, mercenary units especially north of rome in northern lazio or umbria in central italy and those would be the orsinis the vitellis mentioned in chapter 7 and Machiavelli himself will mention how Cesare Borgia used the mercenary soldiers. <laughs>